talk about Alfred Wegener and his idea that the continents were at one time all together in this big continent, this all-encompassing continent called Pangea. And that over time, Pangea had broken apart and the continents had drifted into their present-day locations. And that was a good idea based on the fit of the, fit of the continents. But he had this problem that he couldn't really explain how this could occur. If you also remember, we talked about the idea that uh, uh, Hillary, during the 20s, was measuring heat coming out of Earth and figured, oh, this isn't matching up very well. If it were by conduction, where heat was just touching another, another object and, and it was just atoms on one side exciting atoms on the other side, so they had to be contact with each other, you couldn't move a lot of heat very quickly. And it just wasn't enough. But if we could do it by convection, where the material was moving and the material contained all the energy, all the heat, and as I moved the material, I moved the energy with it. Now I've got a very efficient means of moving energy. And Hillary thought, ah, if this is what I can do, it's just like this pot of boiling water, the area right over the energy, the flame in this case, Water is going to expand as a heat. It's going to rise, hits the top of the surface. It's going to start to spread out, cool off very quickly as that surface area immediately starts to expand across the top of the pot. As it cools, it's going to contract, shrink, become denser. And by the time the water is out at the edge of the pot, it's sinking again. And the cycle repeats. So I've got these cells that are bubbling along. And if you were to look at it, uh, on the top of the pot, you'd see it was a little high here. There was kind of a little, little bump in the water surface. And you'd see the rolling boil, and it meant that this convection was going on. And he said, I think the same thing's happening in Earth. I've got a hot spot. I've got convection going on. Some of the heat's breaking the skin of the, the crust of the Earth. Most of it's happening where that heat is just moving right along the bottom of the crust. And as it does that, that crust is insulating that heat from escaping directly out. But as that heat starts to move sideways, it kind of drags that crust along with it. There's a tractive force between the movement of the underlying asthenosphere here with the heat and the colder crust above. So it's just kind of starting to pull it apart. And as it does that, it allows hot molten material to come up from the down below, fill in the new rib, the new crack. And as it cools, it makes a new crust, attaching itself to the back edge of each of these plates. It in turn cracks and moves apart along with the plates. So this is kind of an ongoing process. So now, Hillary was able to basically come up with a mechanism that would help explain Wegener's idea of continental drift. So what we saw then was this kind of a mechanism with this mantle upwelling, heating the crust. The crust was bulging at that point because as you heat it, it expands. So it was forming a big long ridge as the convection then started to drag the crust apart. This ridge opened up, forming kind of a, a valley we'll call Rift Valley. And that was filling the new molten rock coming up from below. It was cooling and making new crust. And that crust was splitting and moving apart. So I've got this mechanism for making new, new crust on planet Earth. But Earth is a sphere. So if I'm making new crust, where am I going to put it? The Earth is already covered in crust. So this means I've got to get rid of some old crust. And I can do it in a couple of ways. I can just smash it together and stack it up on top of each other, making mountains. Or as this crust moves away from this hot spot, this upwelling mantle of hot material, as it moves off of that point, it's going to start to cool. And as it cools, it's going to shrink. It's going to be 
become denser again, just like the material moving over to the side of the pot. And eventually it's going to be cool enough that it's going to start to go back down into the leaf. There's the other side of my convection zone. And that means as this material moves down into the mantle, it's eventually going to get hot enough where it remelts. It's my recycling center. And some of that material obviously replaces mantle material completing the cycle. Some of it makes its way back to the surface that we see as volcanoes. So that's kind of where we, we are. Wegener's ideas that, oh, it's maybe tidal drag produced by the sun and the moon wasn't going to make it happen. But Hillary's ideas of convection meant that we now had a mechanism that could make Wegener's continental drift idea work. Now, remember when we were talking about the interior of the Earth a time or two ago, and we talked about the fact that Earth had a magnetic field. <coughs> And the fact that that magnetic field, every once in a while, flipped polarity. I can see that in the rocks. So what I'm going to do is kind of use that fact to help test my idea now of what I should be seeing with making new continental crust. Here's our spreading ridge here. Hot mantle material coming up from down below. This is getting hot. It's expanding, forming a ridge. I've got a rift valley in the middle. I'm um, placing new molten material there that's cooling and becoming a rock. This side of the ridge is moving eastward. This side is moving westward as that convection, that drag, kind of pulls it apart. So, in the middle here, as I place this hot molten material and it cools to becoming rock, anything that's magnetically susceptible in that melted rock is going to be aligned with Earth's magnetic field at that time. And when the rock cools, those particles are going to freeze in that orientation. I've got a magnetic recorder here. Now we know the polarity flips. So sometimes when the rock is cooling down, it's going to be normal polarity. Sometimes when the rock is cooling down, it's going to be the reverse polarity. It's whatever the magnetic field is at the time that rock's cooling. And it's an ongoing process, right? So as things rift here and the rock moves apart, some of it's going to be normal polarity rock, some of it's going to be reverse polarity rock, but it's kind of breaking down the middle. So I've got some of it going one way and some of it going the other way. So what I should see if this process is really working is I should see these stripes and these bands of polar polarized magnetic rock on each side of the rift. And you'll notice my pointers are not working very well, but you'll notice that these bands now are parallel to this spreading center, to this, this rift. And you'll also notice that they should be kind of reverse, normal, reverse, normal. They should be pretty much symmetric on each side. <coughs> if I held up a mirror, what I saw as a reflection in one side would be the same as the other side. So parallel striping that's symmetric above the spreading rift. So, can I test that? Well, you bet I can. Back in 1963, Fred Vine, who was working on his PhD in geophysics over in Great Britain, and his professor, D.H. Matthews, they got a deal with the United States Navy to put a magnetometer on board a ship that the Navy was out there doing a bunch of other surveying. And they said, yeah, you know, you put your magnetometer on board. It's not going to cost us any more running the ship anyway. All you got to do is share your data with us. Yeah, that's a good deal. So they did. And as the ship went back and forth, back and forth, all of a sudden this pattern started to emerge that went from normal polarity to reverse polarity, back and forth, back and forth. This straight pattern started to show up. And sure enough, there's the spreading axis. 
the one to Fuqua Ridge. And if you notice, the stripes are parallel to the ridge. And if you look here, these stripes are pretty much like those stripes. This is pretty much like this. It's not perfect, but you can pick it out pretty close. And you wouldn't expect it to be perfect. It's not going to just crack right down the middle and spread equally each time. So it's what you'd expect. Is this just a coincidence? You think it just, they just got lucky and it just happens here? Well, you've got to eliminate that possibility, don't you? So they decided to try it again. And what they did was they went over to the Atlantic Ocean now, and they went just south of Iceland. Because Iceland, they know, is on the spreading ridge in the, or proposed to be on the spreading ridge in the Atlantic. And they did the same thing, back and forth, back and forth. And they got the same parallel stripes, symmetric about the spreading axis. It's just color coded here to kind of point that out for you. Every time we've done this kind of a magnetic survey across a spreading ridge, the same pattern emerges parallel to the spreading ridge, symmetric. So what a great piece of evidence to help support this theory now that we've got this, this going on. And what we've now discovered, rather than the ocean just being this big bathtub thing with straight sides and flat bottom, we've got the world's largest mountain system out there. It's these spreading centers, these mountain systems. Mid-Atlantic Ridge running down through the Atlantic, coming out through the, the Indian Ocean, through the Southern Pacific and up the East Pacific, and a couple ridges over here by South America. All places that new crust is being made, the plates are moving away from each other, is that new crust is being made along the, the rift center. Next piece of evidence. Kind of makes plate tectonics look like a pretty new theory. But there's some other ways I can test it. Remember, if I want to really make a good theory, I want to test it as many different ways as possible. And if I can have all these different <coughs> observations reach the same conclusions, that is powerful. So what other ways can I test the plate tectonic idea, the spreading center concept? Again, technology came to the forefront. And after the war, the Glomar Challenger was, was designed. This was a whole new kind of ship. Out in deep water, it's way too deep to run anchors. You couldn't put enough anchor chain together to do it. The ship couldn't even carry it. You've got to keep the ship in position some other way. And what was invented was dynamic positioning. The ship basically has a series of thrusters, propellers, that can be twisted and turned, turned on and off, sped up, slowed down. And it's all done by computer. So the computer now becomes a real key to all sorts of different technology. It isn't just your laptop, but it's drilling offshore. And all the inputs are things like wind speed, and direction, and currents, and waves, and all this stuff gets put into the computer, and it automatically is turning on and off and twisting these propellers, and it can keep the ship in a spot about three feet in diameter. So that's as much as the ship's going to move around. Isn't that incredible? And the other thing it has to do is be able to lower a drill string down through thousands of feet of water and hit a hole on the bottom of the floor where it's drilling the well and be able to come in and out of that well so they can change <coughs> bits, so they can core it. They basically, when they're drilling this, the drill bit is like a donut. And it's cutting a donut kind of hole. And the drill pipe behind it is hollow. So as they cut this donut-shaped hole, the rock that's left in the center just kind of goes up the, the drill pipe. And after about 60 feet, snap it off, 